ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it is very good to see all of you today, and uh, it's a Monday morning. I know that it's not, it's not easy to wake up for some of you, our students here. Um, so, uh, very good to, uh, to see all of you, and I, I hope that this is not a compulsory lecture for, for you to, to attend. But if it is, I hope that uh, it is worthwhile that it will open uh, some of your perspective into sustainability and what is our, the role of the government and also the role of Malaysia in terms of pushing sustainability or green agenda in Malaysia. Um, around a month ago or a month and a half ago, so I talked to my press secretary. I asked uh, that, you know, uh, there are a lot of times we have, uh, the government has, is doing a lot of agenda and striving a lot of things and, and that the discussion has always been very shallow in terms of what is the headlines given by um, the newspaper. Because newspaper normally will only capture what is actually uh, more of the surface. But I think there is a need for Malaysia to get uh, Malaysians to get into deeper discussion in terms of sustainability. And that cannot be done if there is no detail that, uh, that can be delivered to the people and knowing why we make certain policies uh, and, and that to have a deeper discussion into that. So sometimes I, even in the parliament, because we do not have yet a select committee on sustainability on environment. We have just established one. The whatever that the member of parliament asks usually is from what they read from the newspaper and no other no other place yet. You cannot blame them and you cannot blame whoever that voice uh, their their needs or voice their their views because that is the only available information. So so I then then we say let's embark on a public lecture series and that so that I can actually go and speak to the people about government policies, about why we make such policies, about a deeper understanding into a national agenda, then we have an open discussion and dialogue. And after the open uh, a deeper discussion, if people do have feedback, it will be a, from a perspective that is more than just on the surface of things, but on a deeper understanding of the issues. So I would like to thank uh, Prof. Maslin to be the first one to host our public lecture series. I would like to thank UKM for giving us an opportunity to come. Uh, uh, we, hope that, uh, uh, we hope that this will not be the last uh, in terms of going to universities or um, private universities just to speak on something, on intellectual discussions in, into uh, government policies. So whenever we talk about uh, renewable, uh, we talk about climate change, there are many things that we can talk about but today because there are very limited um, time and that we would like to discuss things in, 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 very, uh, in a deeper manner then I, I choose only one topic to discuss at length that is renewable energy so and uh, power sector shift why is it important? because uh, energy is one of the biggest carbon emitters <laughs> and that uh, to focus on that and only discuss on that and then later on we do other parts as well it's just that we, we will not have time on this discussion if we just go in a, in a broad manner so I would have chosen to do on climate change and then to focus mostly on renewable energy uh, uh, and then we'll let you know other initiatives that we do uh, in the energy sector and sustainability is not only about climate change, it's also about poverty, it's about equality. So that is why, but we, I will discuss only a little bit at the back on what we do in terms of justice, uh, of uh, uh, economic justice, and in terms of uh, social justice in uh, electricity access. So, where do I point? Oh, where do I point? Anyway, okay. so I'm a science and tech minister, I don't know how to use it. Uh, okay, so um, Malaysia is a signatory of uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, we signed the Paris Agreement in 2016, where we give a commitment. Uh, in every uh, uh, Paris Agreement, is a Paris, uh, it's an agreement between more than 190 countries in the world under United Nations uh, framework of climate change, where people sign a commitment into carbon reduction. Cover with one more than 190 countries signing. And uh, all these countries, all of the people who sign it, need to have a national, nationally determined commitment, NDC, National 
determine, uh, nationally determined uh, commitment. And then our commitment in, uh, in Paris Agreement is 45% reduction in carbon emission intensity. That means carbon emission per GDP by 2030 relative to 2005 level. 45% reduction of carbon emission intensity, that means carbon emission per GDP, uh, by 2030 relative to 2005 level. 35% of this 45% is unconditional. 10, extra 10% is conditional upon international uh, help in terms of uh, capacity building or money. So, 40, 35%. So, where are we now? Now, we are 2019, end of 2019, Malaysia has reached 33% of reduction relative to 2005 level. So, you should, you should actually clap a bit. On <laughs> And we only left with 12% to go and 11 more years. So it is actually going to be quite easy and comfortable for Malaysia. If, if we are business as usual, we will likely to keep our Paris Agreement role as a country and a global citizen. Of course, uh, United Nations then came to us, uh, uh, I think to many other countries that are comfortable in their NDC already. Uh, they came to us and asked whether or not we want to increase our national NDCs. Uh, NDCs will be reviewed and re-announced uh, next year. In next year, UNF CCC in Glasgow, UK. Now there is one UNF uh, CCC happening right now in Madrid, uh, which was supposed to happen in Chile, but Chile was in uh, was in riot. Then they transferred it to Madrid. But this one is on uh, more mostly on negotiation on Article Six. Next year we will have a renewed NDC. Whether Malaysia will renew our NDC, a lot of people ask these questions. So, do you think that we should do more to cut our carbon? Uh, so, so if you think that we should review our NDC, raise your hand. Uh, increase our NDC, that means we, we should do better. Raise your hand. Okay. You think we should not? Raise your hand. Oh, there is nobody. What about those that did not raise your hand just now? What was your view? Huh? What was your view just now? Okay, let, let's start again. You must make a decision. Alright, so, so you know, being a person, uh, you must make a decision, alright? You cannot be one or another. So do you think we should actually increase our carbon emission uh, deduction uh, commitment? Those who think that we should, should raise your hand. Okay? Those who think that we should not, raise your hand. Okay, one, two, three. Can I ask why? <laughs> I think we will be able to reach the goal that we, you know, that's good. Just let's see how far we can go. Okay, so don't set yourself too high, but if you exceed the goal, it's better, right? Okay, alright, what about you? <laughs> okay, developing stage. Okay, and yourself? Uh, okay, so the government is looking into that. Okay, the, 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 the reason, NDCs, so in the international negotiation on climate change alone, so a lot of people are asking, why, why, are, why aren't we doing more, right? So, so, of course we want to do more, but let's think of, of this this way. In an international negotiation, if you look into climate science, and you will know that climate, a global warming phenomenon, is actually caused by historical emission of carbon accumulation at the atmospheric since industrialization. That time, who become rich by emitting a lot of carbon? UK, the developed country, they become rich. But the carbon that they emit, burning the coal, burning the inefficient diesel engine is still up there in the atmosphere. And it is because of the accumulation of this carbon at the atmosphere that we are facing with a global warming problem. Further increase is not advisable. That means we need to reduce. You need to reach a peak. Because right now, even with Paris Agreement commitment, what 
the international is planning is that to limit because any of you from chemical background? Yeah, yeah, just one or two of you. Okay, because we are a big mass body, you need to reach an equilibrium. For example, if there is a concentration of a lot of carbons right now, even if you stop emitting, the temperature is still going to rise. You reduce them, you reduce you will, uh, you reduce your emission. Temperature is going to rise, but at the lower level. Your business as usual. Temperature is going to rise at the very quick manner. So now, so who is supposed to pay for this? So question on the international discussion has always been, who is supposed to be responsible for the global warming that happened right now? The developed world or the developing world? Is it justice, is it fair for developing countries to sacrifice economic development to cut our carbon emission for the historical debt that is caused by the developed country? So this is, this is a negotiation. It's an international negotiation, what we call common but differentiated responsibility. Malaysia is vocal in common but differentiated responsibilities. Meaning to say, we say all needs to reduce carbon. But, there is a but there. But, someone needs to pay higher price. Someone needs to pay lower price. That means we have a common, but it is differentiated. Differentiated among the developed, developing country and the least developed world. And, and that if Malaysia or develop the least developed world is to ask to further reduce our emissions, we must not do it at the price that sacrifice economic development. And therefore, whatever we do must then be able to be compensated or that there is an industry and there's an economic side of it. That later on I'm going to discuss with you how reducing carbon may not necessarily mean more money has to be spent. But the overall idea is this, is that because Malaysia is a developing country and it is unfair for us to be told by the developed country that we should cut our carbon when they don't cut themselves or they don't give us the assistance enough to cut. That is why we always negotiate on the basis of common but differentiated responsibilities. And that Malaysia would like to continue to be vocal among the developing countries in the UNFCCC so we get the best deal for our country. But that's, that's why it is not easy. So the negotiation will take three weeks. So this, it, it's already started this round um, and then um, next year. But that doesn't mean that we are not going to increase. I'm just saying that whenever we talk about our carbon emission commitment, we must know we can actually do more, but we don't need to commit more. We, we can actually do more, we don't commit more because it is unfair. Okay, if you want to do more, you must actually put a, a more to get the best deal for your country. So those are some of the things that in the international uh, negotiation, what we do. But uh, I would say that uh, the, 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 the team in Malaysia, uh, we are building the capacity of international negotiation. Otherwise, the developed country can hire a lot of lobbyists in the international. Then they will drive their own agenda that we will eventually be sacrificed because of this international convention that we signed. So we must be very, very careful, intellectual, be able to speak up in the, this international. So, so, so that is uh, basically our thing. 45% reduction, uh, carbon emission intensity reduction, common but differentiated responsibilities in the position. So in, in terms of climate change, one of the things that is very, very difficult right now is this, is that how do we control carbon emission? Whenever we talk about climate change, there are two things we talk about. Climate adaptation and climate mitigation. Climate change, there is adaptation. Mitigation, we, call, we go on mitigation first. Mitigation is easy. Mitigation, how do we cut carbon? So we reduce the rate of increase 
of the globe, uh, the, the, the warming world to 2% according to the Paris Agreement. The other part is adaptation. Adaptation means that, just how I said, no matter what the world is going to warm, it's the rate that you do not know. That means, uh, we will always call it scenario. So it's two Celsius scenario. Let's say, for example, if the world is to warm two Celsius, what is going to happen to Malaysia? What is going to happen in your shoreline? Which city is going to be uh, flooded? Or uh, how uh, the food chain is going to be different? Uh, any agriculture students here? So, food chain is going to be very, very affected. You know why? Because at different temperature range, different bacteria is going to be, or virus is going to be active. And therefore, there will be a lot of diseases that you will not be able to see right now, and that will come in your food ecosystem. So your whole food chain will change. Your rain pattern will change. All of this will change. That is adaptation part of it. But climate change also is cross-ministerial. Not only uh, that MESTEC is doing it. MESTEC is only the coordinating one. It involves MOA, Ministry of Agriculture. It involves Ministry of Transport. Because why? Some of, a lot of carbon is, comes from your cars. Comes from transportation, comes from all this. It involves MOT. It involves a Ministry of uh, Human, uh, Human Natural, Natural Resources, CATCH. Kementerian Air Tanah dan Sumber Asli. Kementerian Air Tanah dan Sumber Asli, why? Because forest is under Kementerian Air Tanah dan Sumber Asli. And whenever we talk about carbon emission, we also need to talk about carbon sink, forest, mangroves, and all that are carbon sink. It also involves um, uh, the, the, the social development. Why? Simple, because most of the time when climate change happens, the most vulnerable group are the, the poorest of all. They involve many things. So how do we coordinate that? We need a centre to coordinate this. We need a centre to analyse what is the risk that is. Uh, we need to analyse anal with big data to know what exactly is going to happen in two Celsius scenario in our shoreline, in our food chain, in our everything, and how do we prepare right now so that our infrastructure, our policies, people are actually able to resist, to have developed resistance towards this climate change. So we need a centre. That is why, to, and then because of multi-level, we have state government, federal government, local government, because emission, 70% of our emission come from cities. So city, PBT, local government also needs to be a part of it. So cross-ministerial, cross different levels of government. That is why we need a centre to coordinate this. And that uh, end of, uh, just in October, uh, with the Prime Ministers have just launched uh, Malaysia Green Tech and Climate Change Centre, where we will focus next year on really developing to be the focal point of Malaysian government in climate action, in adaptation and mitigation of climate change. And, and this is a repurposing of, uh, of the, uh, the repurposing of Malaysian Green Tech corporations because we want to save money, uh, we repurpose an agency, making it bigger, making streamline all our organisation so that we can arrive and achieve objectives uh, without extra, a lot more extra money. So another one that we are going to establish, uh, we are coming up with the tour right now, a term of reference, uh, which is we already promised in Boko Harapan, is that we would we would uh, have a national coordination council for climate adaptation and mitigation, and this one we will be we would like to be a part in MGCC Malaysia Green Tech and Climate Change Centre, a part of it, and this coordination council will involve industry, involves academics, involve multi engagement, uh, uh, multi uh, um, uh, stakeholders to be in the National Coordination Council. So we actually coordinate our action, climate action. So these are some of the things we do on climate and on sustainability. One of the things we do also, we promise since last year that uh, it, because it is our promise in the Buku Harapan that we will not develop nuclear power in Malaysia. Um, so I think in a common ground, 
in the common, uh, uh, normally public will not reject no nuclear power. But normally the, the, the resistance comes from the academics. So a lot of people tell me, nuclear power is a green energy. Because if you look into carbon emission, nuclear is actually emit less carbon, much less carbon per kilo hour than all the other things. Why then we say no to nuclear power? For a few reasons. One is because we believe that renewable energy becomes more and more competitive. We will be able to have a competitive green energy that is much safer to deploy. Second is this. Second is looking at Malaysia. You know, if you look around in Malaysia, uh, even there is a change of government, we still need a lot of time to develop our enforcement muscle. Just look around you. Is there any illegal factories around? Yeah? Do you think so? Yes? Do you think that a lot of people throw some bath everywhere? Yes. Uh, do you think that uh, we need, uh, there, there are not much of enforcement from the government? Yes. You think so? You think Malaysian regulator is uh, is uh, strong enough? Oh. Not really, right? Why? Because uh, for a few reasons. One is perhaps uh, Malaysia by itself culturally is a very tolerant community. If you look into how our because why we ne we are never into crisis. We have no earthquake. We have no typhoon, we have no nothing. Uh, so, naturally, regulators or Malaysia as a whole, we like to say Tapala give chance. But even that, Malaysians lack the enforcement spirit. I face a problem. I ask myself if my Jabatan Alam Skita still needs some time for reform to regulate. Illegal factories, illegal dumping, scheduled waves, etc. Will there be any agency in Malaysia strong enough to enforce strict nuclear power regulation? On the size of it, it is possible, but on the context of culture and national development, I think it is a safer choice for us to say no for now. You, you got I me? Mean? It is not because the science doesn't prove that it is. It is actually uh, can be regulated, can be regulated in a strict enforcement manner to be able to do that. But I think Malaysians must get our right footing first. We must make sure that we uh, develop the culture of enforcement first, which I'm going to do that. Develop, and then maybe 10, 20 years you think about it, but by then, I, I believe renewable energy will already be very, very competitive. That we will not take the route of nuclear power. So, so that is why I explain in full in, in this uh, this talk because only the intellectuals will say that Mestek Minister is not scientific. She decides not to use nuclear power. She doesn't know the science. <laughs> Actually, I studied about nuclear power in uh, in, uh, in Cambridge. I, but I believe uh, strongly that this is not a safe route for us to go. Uh, and that there is no technology yet in the world that can safely process the radioactive waste. We will still waste a piece of land for permanently disposing this radioactive waste. So, so I think there are better ways for us to move forward. And therefore, it is not a it's not an uninformed decision. It's an informed decision uh, that is made by the government that it is not the best route for risk. So this is on nuclear power. So what is our what is our target on this? So renewable energy, we, we, we set a target, this is also a Boko Haraban target, that we would like to increase renewable energy in our electricity generation mix. From now, it's about 4%, 5%, to 20% by 2025, excluding large hydro above 100 megawatt. Uh, why we want to exclude that in this national target? Because at this moment, we are already 23%. If you calculate all the big hydro dam, 
in Sarawak. But there's always a discussion whether big hydro is green. Why? When you have big hydro, that means your dam is going to sink all your forests, who, which is a carbon sink. So, so, so there is a lot of uh, uh, there is a lot of discussion on that. That is why we set two different targets. One is our national targets on twenty percent that do not calculate the the big hydros that that sink uh, our carbon sink. The other one is the the other the general uh, uh, calculation that include uh, big hydro like uh, Bakun Dam and the big dams in Sarawak. Uh, it is still a lot of uh, discussion into um, why the big hydro is weak. But that, that is not our discussion today. The discussion of today is that today, government sets two different targets so that we can actually walk into the other type of targets as well. So in order for us to reach the 20%, what we are going to do is that we need from now until 2025 a 6.9 gigawatt of additional power. Uh, this is some of the... Uh, some of the uh, uh, different types of power uh, that we will need and uh, it, it is in our estimation uh, biogas, biomass and solar um, the, the blue one is small hydro so we will need about 6.9 gigawatt from now until 2025 so how do we achieve that? so we do not only tell about that we need a national goal but we also need government strategy so these are the three main uh, strategies that we do to achieve our IE target. First is net energy metering, second is large scale solar, third is fit in tariff mechanism. I'm going to go one by one into these three different strategies on achieving the 20% target. The first one is net energy metering. What does net energy metering mean? It means that you actually, if you are a consumer of electricity, you can also sell electricity, if it is renewable energy, back to the national grid. i give you an example, but it is not only limited to, but the most use of the energy metering is rooftop solar. So what happens is that, number one, you will have rooftop, you pass on your rooftop solar on your rooftop, then you will use, uh, you generate electricity, then you use it in your house. If you have extra, you sell it to the grid. We used to have this net energy metering policy, but the selling price is only 30 cents at the displaced cost. Nobody thinks that it's worthwhile to invest in the capex of this. Now we have renewed it in the end of 2018. Starting from this year, we actually go on a one on one offset basis, meaning to say that you buy and sell at the same price. What does buy and sell at the same price? For example, if you are in the 600 kilowatt hour tier in the residential or you are commercial or in the free, you buy from, from grid at 50 cent, 40 cent, you sell at 50 cent, 40 cent and no longer 30 cent. So the calculation of your bill is equal to uh, consumption minus generation times with your tariff. So this one will make uh, together with our tax allowance, green investment tax allowance will make, you see, uh, once you can sell, you will have savings, right? Every month. Because you, you, you used to be able to only buy, now you can sell. So you have savings. Let's say you save 30% of your electricity bill. You used to have 100, now you have 30, 70 ringgit. So, you pay 70. so every month, uh, you save 300, uh, 30 ringgit. So, but usually it's not like, usually such a small solar panel, it doesn't make sense. Like. Let's say you save 300 ringgit. Like, huh? So if it is 1,000, you save 300 ringgit. And then every month you save money. But you need money to invest in capex, right? So together for the industry and the commercial with our ITA, investment tax allowance, your payback period now reduced to about 3 to 5 years. That means that uh, if I pour my solar panel, after five years, maximum after five years, my company is going to enjoy savings of electricity bills. So let's say I put on, let's say normally uh, a company will put on 200,000 at least, uh, 400,000. After three to five years, 
from my savings, I actually get back the three to four hundred thousand ringgit. Then, upon which, from then onward, through the life of this carbon, uh, to, to the life of this uh, 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 this uh, panel, I'm going to save the thirty percent continuously. So this makes a very good deal for people in the, uh, in the corporate and the industry. And um, mm. just to give you an example of how much of uh, because a lot of people say you put roof, you put a, a solar panel. Uh, if it is on a forest, that means bring no meaning because you cut the tree just to put on. Uh, must you, you must do it in a great uh, brown field. That means those that are already cut agriculture land, uh, uh, mining and etc. But another one is on rooftop. You see how much rooftop we have right in Malaysia. We have 3.2 landed properties, 450,000 shop lots, 90,000 of terrace, uh, terrace uh, factories. We have 21,000 stand alone factories. And for the ladies, you actually have 1,000 shopping complex around the country. And shopping complex normally have a flat, flat roof. All of this land do nothing except to collect dust and sometimes the dust grow also <laughs> now you have extra things that you can do you can put on rooftop solar get savings and to be clean so, so we have designed this and that for people who have no cash what do we do? so, so we, we start, we, we do this so now government is getting into drafting designing policy in such a way that we are not only decarbonizing we make an economic case out of decarbonizing. That suits a developing country context. This one is those with money. What about those without cash? Can we do something of those without cash but with a lot of books? So with this, what we do is this. We give incentives recently only in budget just announced 2020. We'll give incentives uh, of green investment tax exemption to solar leasing companies. How does solar leasing work? Uh, we have renewed the policy that, for example, somebody come to your factory and say, or oh, oh, UKM should do more. UKM have uh, So let's say somebody comes to UKM and say, UKM, you have a lot of roofs. You even have a lot of uh, land for car parks. We can build solar panel car park roof for you and solar panel to cover up your, your rooftop. We come to you. Zero upfront cost, you don't need to pay because the university has no money. Yeah. Uh, right? <laughs> Everyone knows. No money, you don't need to pay. But, uh, they, they come about. They will sell you, but you don't get 30% of savings, you get only 50 Because the other 50 I'll take it. Okay? Or they say, I sell you electricity, solar power, but at a cheaper rate. So you used to buy from DMB 40 cents. But now I can sell you. If I put on this, free for you, but I sell you the electricity 30 cents a day. So for you, you are still saving money. You are still saving money, you zero upfront cost. That means you, you don't need to pay, somebody comes to pay, but your saving will be less than if you put an upfront cost. Lah. Okay? That is called solar leasing. End of this year, uh, the finance minister has just announced from next year onwards, we give exemption to solar leasing company. 70% of their income is tax exempted. So a lot of uh, this incentivizes a lot, a lot of uh, solar leasing companies to want to get into this uh, this business. We believe that solar leasing will fly, uh, uh, will will get more and more uh, next year because this year mostly are those who can pay outright because we don't have that 70% uh, tax exemption. Next year, we believe that there will be much more uh, for, for zero upfront costs under the solar leasing uh, policies. That is how the government wants to draft. You know, gone is the time that we think every time we want to drive an agenda, government needs to come up with money. That is a very conventional way of drafting policies. Uh, drafting mm -hmm. policies must be such that First, can we actually design a policy that will be able to finance itself? Can we actually design a policy that will be able to generate economic growth? Can we actually design a policy that reaches our agenda 
and yet have an economic case of it, like this. If you design a policy with NEM plus data, you will be able to tell your part, your stakeholders, not you must decarbonize, you must reduce the carbon. I put a law to you. You must reduce your carbon, therefore you must install the solar. No, we tell you, you must do it because it saves you money. Save you money, help the government to drive the carbon agenda. So these are some of the, I think, a paradigm shift that the new generation of policy makers must think of whenever we think of new policies. Can we make the project bankable? The moment you make a project bankable, which means that you can actually get financing from the bank, then you don't need government. What happened is this. The moment you get financing from the bank, the banks also get to create more jobs because they need specialists in evaluating projects, services, jobs like this. So those are the jobs that later on we'll talk about renewable energy jobs. But these are the things that we need to think about whenever we talk about sustainability especially in the developing country context. It's not every day about tax. A lot of people ask me about carbon tax. Yeah. Uh, some, especially intellectual people. <laughs> then they, they will say, uh, Mr. Minister, it's not intellectual enough. Why don't you do uh, carbon tax? A lot of people ask me about carbon tax. But a lot of time, regulatory tool doesn't necessarily mean, means punishing people. Regulatory tools, especially if you are in a democracy, Every five years, you need to get your votes. You must first exhaust what can benefit the people and benefit the environment before you go into things that punish the people, benefit the environment. So, so those are the things. I give you a this year, even without our GITE, uh, the means tax exemption to the solar leasing, uh, we see an uptake rate of three times in just nine months. We have three times more and net energy metric uptake than what is achieved previously before the renewal of this policy for three years. What they get is 20 megawatt in three years. What we get in the first nine months, we get 60 megawatt of approved net energy free. Uh, later on, uh, before the year end, I'm just I'm going to, to, to launch one of the biggest so far on the net energy metering projects of one factory installing 19 megawatt of, uh, for those of you who are in the energy business, you know this is huge on um, uh, behind the meter net energy metering uptake. So those are some of the things that uh, if you have more time, you want to do study on net energy metering, do study on this, um, you can go to setup.gov.ny. That part you would uh, you will be seeing there are lockdown policies. We make it very, very friendly uh, to people who want to do uh, uh, understanding more of our policies. Not only net energy metering policy for tariff uh, and uh, they are all there. Uh, we even have a calculator. Let's say you put on a calculator and see whether you want to install solar. This is a result of a net energy metering calculator. Then you, let's say for example, your current bill is 500. Depending on what you declare in the calculator, your monthly bill after that is 1,007. You, your savings is 3,000, but your estimated upfront cost, 200,000. This is for a small commercial uh, commercial uh, practice. Then your payment period is 7.5 years. This is before tax allowance. 7.5 years. Uh, this is it's on a different on case on case basis. I'm just giving you this as a result of the net, uh, the calculator. But it depends on what you input in your calculator. We have a net uh, it's, it's inside the data website. You have a net energy metering calculator. Then you can even see your environment impact. How much of a tree you actually uh, do the seeding? How many? Uh, car, you actually bring uh, uh, how many millions of uh, kilometers you avoid from traveling, etc. Et so it depends on your roof, it depends on the size of your roof, it depends on your bill, it depends on your commercial players or different tariffs. You will have a different payback period, etc. But just to remind you that this one is before tax, before tax allowance. So the energy metering will benefit mostly corporate uh, and, uh, and industry for now. With solar leasing, maybe residential will, will, get, uh, will, be, will, will get benefits. Uh, so, because uh, if you know about the tariff in Malaysia, actually the domestic, the domestic tariff is subsidized by commercial industry. 
So we would like to do something for the commercial industry so that they get to have some savings through this. And also the impact is higher because they have bigger rules and all that. Then we will shift it from big impact to the smaller one so that we can see more and more. So this is on energy metering. On last year solar, last year solar is simple. You have a piece of land, you put on solar, then you generate electricity. That is very simple. I just want to give you an idea. Uh, beginning of this year, we opened tender for large scale solar, 500 megawatt. We opened tender, large scale solar. We received the bids uh, in uh, August. Now we are in the final stage of evaluation of this large scale solar. But the price of the bid, so you rank the price, right? You rank the price. The 300, the first 365 out of 500 megawatt. The price of the last year solar generation is lower than 23.22 cents per kilowatt hour. So what is 23.22 cents per kilowatt hour? 23.22 cents per kilowatt hour is the generation cost, average generation cost of gas power plant. For the first time in the history of Malaysia, that solar power is actually right now officially cheaper than gas power plant. You should clap for this. Yeah. You know why it's important? Because a lot of times people tell you, decarbonizing, going into renewable energy, is uh, not business friendly. You are paying a premium to go for it. But today, we can show that with the right framework, right capacity, right tender specification, you actually, and the right technology, because technology has got more mature, you actually, solar power in Malaysian context, because depending on where you are in the world, solar is different. Yeah? In Malaysian context, solar energy has become not only a green alternative, but a cheaper alternative than gas. We are still far from coal. The moment we can replace coal, coal is at 15 cents per kilowatt hour. So, so gas and coal is different. Gas and coal. So if we are able to get to 15 cents per kilo hour, and we, the moment we can replace coal with our renewable energy, is the time we hit the trigger point of a huge carbon emission reduction um, uh, point. Right now, we are the lowest one. Lowest bit is 17.77 cents. This. I, uh, I remember the, all the big players, TMB, YTL, um, all those, they discuss you know, how much you beat, how much you beat. Because LSS2, round two, the reference price is 32 cents. So everyone said, okay, 26 cents, we can earn a lot of money, we can also win. But the moment they submitted the, the, the bid and we ran the price, all the big players, yes, it's gone. They think that Industry cannot give them lower than 26 cents. But with competitive bidding, the lowest we get is 17.77 cents. And that is why I see the, for last year's solar to be lower than 15 cents, we just need a few more innovation, a few more years, and then we will see this coming. If we see this coming, it will be much easier for the government. Because government, as the energy minister, I want to make sure that electricity is not only clean, most important, affordable. Yeah, every time uh, I, you ask me about tariff, you know, every time tariff, you know. So I must make sure that it's affordable. I must make sure the new resources that come online are affordable to the people. So this is on the lowest bit. Another one, uh, I've talked a lot about solar. Actually, we still work on other types of uh, other types of uh, renewable energy on biogas, biomass, geothermal, and small hydro. Um, so this one is under the interim mechanism. The interim mechanism was started a long time ago uh, under the Renewable Energy Act, where a premium, uh, a, 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 a premium is charged to customers who, are, uh, who consume 600 kilowatt and above. 1.6% uh, of their electricity bill go into renewable energy funds to fund fee tariff mechanism. At fee tariff mechanism, what we do is that somebody produces electricity, they sell to TMB at a premium price. 
Then the government, PMB pay them some, the government top up. Government top up is the renewable energy funds that is collected from the electricity uh, bill. So, so what do we do? We continue to do that. Uh, for more information, you can go to SEDA. But what we do uh, since 2018 is this, that some of these fit-in tariff uh, projects are non-performing. So last year, we revoked about 389 FIT projects. They are non-performing. You take the quota, you are not building it, uh, you are trying to sell. A lot of times, last time, people want to take the quota and they want to, they want to flip. What does flip mean? I get the quota, I, go to, I don't know how to build RE thing, I go to sell my project because you get the quota. Mm. So we cancel all of them, 389 of them. Uh, we save 2.1 billion ringgit and then with this 2.1 billion ringgit, we'll open up more quota for qualified RE players to get, uh, to get the projects. And we also introduce what we call e -bidding. We used to have a fit-in tariff uh, where we actually give you a scheduled price. That means even if you can bid lower, I still give you high. So now we introduced for the first time, uh, end of last year, we had biogas, uh, end of 2018, we had biogas. This year, we started phase two biogas and then we have small hydro on e-bidding where people still need to bid. The moment you need to bid with my same RE price, that means I can actually uh, give more quota to people for renewable energy. So this is the renewal of the fit-in tariff uh, mechanism. To summarize everything, uh, if we want to get this happen, we need a lot of enablers, government policy tools. These are the six. The green, the yellow one is uh, Gita, uh, 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 the one that we have already practiced but is improved. The green one is the one that we have just launched. The grey one is uh, that we are going to launch next year. GTFS, uh, Green Technology Financing Scheme, is a financing scheme where you use, uh, but renewable energy players usually very difficult to get loan because they are new technology and our bankers are conventional, they are conservative. Very difficult to get loan. So what do we do? We say government guarantees 60% of the loan, 2% uh, interest rate subsidies. Say for example, uh, if you want to build a uh, Biogas plant for a uh, palm oil mill. Biogas plant, I go to the bank, bank say, ah, I don't really trust you lah, because you only do two projects. Then you come, no, I am qualified for GTFS, government guarantees 60%. If I run away, government pay lah. If I don't run away, uh, I don't pay. So government guarantees 60% of the loan, and then they say, if the bank is willing to give you 8% interest, because it's a risky project, usually they charge higher. Then you get 2% subsidies. That means you pay 4%, uh, 6%. 6% of your interest, uh, the 2% is paid by the government, GDFS. There's GDFS. GDFS 2019 and 2018 is for a total loan of 2 billion ringgit. So those are uh, interested can go to MGTC website, uh, MGCC website, Malaysia Green Tech uh, Corporation website. So all, in Sena website, all of it are available, yeah? uh, especially the top three. Green investment tax allowance, just like I say already, not only on solar, on anything that's green. As long as in the Gazette, there are four different types of assets or services that you get capex tax allowance. That is for corporates. Corporates who, who invest in green services, green assets and all that, you will be able to get tax allowance from the government. Green income tax exemption is corporates or companies who offer green services get this uh, exemption. Just now I say, <clears throat> Solar leasing company gets 70% of tax exemption, income tax exemption. Green tariff and renewable energy certificates go this like this. Right now, um, I, I give you an example. Who among you actually drive an electric vehicle? Hybrid. Nobody, uh? Hybrid. Hybrid? Okay. Uh, you drive an electric vehicle? Okay. Who among you think electric vehicle actually help to save the, uh, help to reduce your carbon footprint. You don't have a Tesla, you don't have an electric vehicle, but you think that actually electric vehicle actually help to reduce your carbon footprint, can I have a ring of Only one, only one must you think that electric vehicle too? Okay, how many of you think electric vehicle help to reduce carbon footprint? Can you raise a hand? 
Okay, many, quite many of you, electric vehicles. Uh, I get to ask a lot also. Uh, so does electric vehicle in Malaysia actually help to reduce your carbon footprint? You might think. Right? So now, I ask you. So if you have an electric vehicle, where will you get your electricity from? <laughs> Yeah. From, the right? from the charging point. From the charging point. Where does the charging point get the electricity from? <laughs> from the grid. From the grid. More than 90% of the grid, unfortunately, I want to tell you, uh, are from gas or coal. Uh, gas and or coal, uh, 50 over percent are from coal, 40% are from gas. Eventually, you are getting uh, fossil fuel to charge to your to your EV. But you still save, la, save a little bit. Ah, the problem is that EV is carbon intensive to build. So if we know we talk about climate, when we talk about carbon footprint, we must think of the life cycle. EV is made of batteries. Battery is made of precious metals. Precious metal is very carbon intensive and energy intensive to mine. So if you think from the graph point of view, your carbon footprint when you go in go on the road with energy efficient hybrid uh, car mm -hmm. EV is negative so much more than a hybrid than an energy efficient car you go on road although you have savings lah, you have some savings you need to drive certain amount of the years depending on the life cycle analysis to say that okay now I am at the par with a fossil fuel car then now I start to save the world you don't start to save the world the moment you go on road. The moment you, 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 you will need some time to return your carbon footprint first. Uh, and then how fast you return your carbon footprint depends on where you get your electricity from. So your electricity can come from the grid or right now, for those of you who are really environment friendly, actually the government gives you a green tariff. TNB, it's recently just launched Green Tariff Rider. What does that mean? You, you plug on this, and of course you still get electrons. Lah. Electricity, if it is RE or normal electricity, eventually it's electrons. Lah. Electrons doesn't. But your bill will have a Green Tariff Rider, uh, 8 cents per kilo hour, where you use this one, 8 cents, is to fund large scale solar projects. So you are paying for renewable energy. So the moment, now it's 8 cents, but as LSS, as our large scale solar projects get cheaper and cheaper, the 8 cents will get less and less. But now we start with 8 cents. So this one, for those who are really environment friendly, especially those who buy Tesla car, make sure you tell your friend. If you, okay, sorry. We still have only five more minutes. Okay. If you actually drive Tesla car and don't there, don't even dare to actually take the electricity. Make sure they buy green tariff rider. Yeah. Huh? So to make sure they are really green. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alright? But that depends. That depends. Uh, so now you have green tariff rider. They can, you can also buy renewable energy certificates. How does renewable energy certificates uh, work? Renewable energy certificates is this. Uh, this one is very straightforward. You just pay your bill. Pay the bill and the separate bill will use to do the uh, renewable energy. This one is called REX. REX uh, is renewable energy certificates where if you are electricity, uh, you, uh, you, you will actually have a carbon credit if you are RE producers. So usually RE producers last time only sell electricity, never sell environment attributes. Environment attributes that means your carbon that can be offset. Right now, we launch even a trading platform for renewable energy certificates. Those of you who say, okay, I want to make sure, I, I still can fly. I want to fly. Yes. But I have a carbon emission. <laughs> so I need to buy an offset. You can say now, I then buy from renewable energy certificates. We are right now working on carbon trading. That means you straight away buy carbon. You don't even buy the renewable energy. We're working on that. That, that means that you can say, okay, today, we still turn on our light, we still turn on aircon, but we can zero carbon footprint. How do you do that? Pay. You do that by paying. You buy carbon offset. Do you think anybody will want to do that? There will be. 
You know why? Because uh, there is a big trend among multinational company. They want to, they are signing up for RE100. You can Google what is RE100. That generally is renewable energy 100%. So there are many multinational companies, including Apple, Amazon, and Google, all that, they, they, Facebook, they sign as an RE100 companies, where by I think 30 or 2050, they want to make sure that whatever electrons that they get from the grid is green. So this can be done through renewable energy certificates, it can be done through green tariff, it can also be done through carbon offset trading, where we were we are going to uh, uh, work on next year. But it is not in the in the in the pipeline yet to launch. Um, you can buy. You, you can remain an RE100 company, and a lot of MSCs already have their carbon carbon reduction plan. That means they need to buy. So how Malaysia can monetize on this? Say for example. If today we give a commitment of 45% reduction, we increase more our carbon footprint, that means you cannot sell. You know what I mean? Because that one you need to count as your own. You can only sell when you have extra. So that is why, let's say for example, if we keep and give forest, we have more carbon. It means we have more carbon uh, sink, right? You have two choices. One is to say, okay, Malaysia increase more of our carbon reduction. Second is to sell it. So this is always a discussion among the policy make, among the policymakers or whether to sell the environment attributes or to actually count it as an environment. Uh, are you all following me? The, the market mechanism of it. So uh, the other one we are going to launch next year is RE trading. Today in your grid, it is not possible at all to sell renewable energy through the grid because you can only sell to the DMB. So now Next year, we're going to have a framework where, let's say, so for example, if I have a large fuel solar, I generate solar energy from my water reservoir. Okay? I want to sell this to the nearby cement plant. But I need to inject into the transmission line so that I can sell it like a toe. You are, you are shifting your electrons through a toe, that means the grid, national grid, to a cement plant nearby. Right now, you cannot do it. So we are doing up a, a, a policy framework where renewable energy player, only renewable energy player, if you are the other players, you cannot. Renewable energy player, you want to sell 100% true grid, we open up for you, but you pay the toll, toll charge, like toll up, because you pass through the grid, it's like toll, you pay the toll charge, you sell it to the cement plant nearby. So this is our trading. This will be made available next year on a smaller scale, but we are coming up with the, the body access law to be able to formalize it. So, so these are some of the RE enablers. What does economically mean to us on uh, this RE, RE goal? A lot of people say a lot of money needs to be spent. No, a lot of investment will be attracted by our national goal. It's 33.25 billion ringgit of investment from now until 2025 and how many jobs can this create that is uh, more than more than one by 2025 there will be more than 100,000 and free employment in Malaysia at this moment we have about 4, 50 over percent mostly are for manufacturing because we do not have a national target on engineering and commissioning and construction because there is no national target of uh, of doing renewable energy player uh, the renewable energy projects uh, but by 2025, we'll be able to generate 100,000 uh, employments, jobs, green jobs. In. So again, green is not about just about saving the uh, world. It's really about creating new industry uh, for the country. But you may ask, oh, if it's just solar replacing coal, that means that you replace solar jobs with the coal, uh, replace coal uh, jobs from coal generation to solar generation. And it's not true. Eh? If this is the graph on the <coughs> employment uh, reports on the US, one gigawatt hour of solar power is able to generate 6.65 jobs, whereas for coal is 0.07 and for natural gas is 0.06. That means, this means what? It's not a one-on-one -on -one replacement. By having more 
renewable energy, especially rooftop solar. <coughs> rooftop solar can generate a lot of TVET jobs for technicians, uh, for maintenance, uh, 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 maintenance uh, technicians, etc., and for engineers who design the uh, design the rooftop. But generally, you are replacing an uh, uh, energy source that generate more jobs than a conventional one. So right now, you do not only have a renewable energy target that will help to reduce your carbon footprint, you have a renewable energy target that is able to attract 33.25 billion, that is able to generate more than 50,000 employment, that is new to the country, that is not a replacement of jobs. So this is the context of, uh, of, of, of our renewable energy. Because of time, I don't have time to go through what are the different things that we do on this. Um, there's only one thing that I would like to highlight in our uh, Malaysia uh, uh, transformation plan. Um, before the, we, we have, uh, if you want to, if you want to just Google up, we, we also have a big uh, reform plan on electricity industry. Uh, you can just type uh, government to liberalize power sector. There will have a very uh, detailed, uh, 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 detailed explanation of how we liberalize um, the uh, uh, power sector. But these are some of the things that we do before our power sectors uh, liberalize. One is that um, uh, in 2018, before the general election, there are actually a lot of IPP projects being awarded in, in, the, uh, in the span of just one year direct tender, uh, very, very high price uh, to, to the people. And we managed to, in a, from 2018 onwards, uh, cancel, until today we cancelled six power projects. Uh, that is not needed by the, by the industry, that is not needed by the users. If you put in it, you will have to pay more, just the tariffs have to pay more. Four gas plant high power plant, two hydro projects, with a savings of 11.4 billion ringgit to the tariff users, uh, to the electricity users. And, uh, and, uh, and we really want to make our electricity industry more efficient. But if, because I have no time, uh, I will not go into that. Uh, this is across the value chain of how the government wants to put in more competition across the value chain in the electricity industry so that we can get the whole electricity industry to be more competitive and innovative. Sometimes government makes policies to open up for people that is competitive and innovative. And that, uh, so we have fuel generation, grid, retail. After the reform, uh, by 2025, we will open up fuel. This is, a, this is a value chain. You first of all, you buy fuel, then you generate, then go through the grid and then retail. It used to be only generations through open tender, uh, competitive, but even this, sometimes it's direct award. But right now, what we do is this, where we open up for few procurement, no longer just a monopoly of KMBF and Petronas, but you have extra. Then we open up for generation to, uh, generations already open up, we make sure that it's open tender uh, through a wholesale market. Then transmission and distribution, because of the nature of it, we can only have one grid, it will maintain as a monopoly, just one. But incentive-based regulation we will regulate it, yeah, regulated tariff and regulated profit. There will still be a monopoly, but their profit will be regulated, and then you will have more retailer. That means beside TMB, there will be more people selling electricity. So this is how not only we talk about sustainability in terms of renewable energy, but I don't I don't have time to go into it. Uh, energy efficiency that needs to requires one and another one hour of lecture. But not only that, we are also looking into industry how to make it more competitive and innovative. Only with this that the people get the best from us. Of course, uh, because it's a very, very complicated time frame, we will have a milestone that differently and how we want to put everything in place uh, on the next initiative. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through this. Um, Low income, miskin, miskin tega. We we give forty ringgit tax uh, rebate, uh, subsidies rebate, uh, uh, electricity tariff rebate, bill rebate every month forty ringgit. We used to have a uh, twenty ringgit rebate policies before uh, uh, before I came in as a minister. Twenty ringgit to everyone that is below 
uh, the, the bill below 20 ringgit. Everyone gets it. Whether you are rich or poor, you get it. Now we say, no, only give, we double up the subsidies, but we only give to those who registered with ICASE. It means those who are poor and hardcore poor. After one year, we, we actually implement what we call targeted subsidies. Uh, I, this is, uh, for those of you who learn maths, this is uh, high school maths. Huh? Okay. This is people who take, get a bundle salary, don't be 40. This is people who actually are poor and really poor. It's on this. And this is the people who used to get 20 ringgit. So we do a mapping. Then we realize that before this, we give 20 ringgit subsidies. What happened is that more than 1.12 million recipients, but who are they? More than 980,000 of them are not poor or not even B40. The poor and the hardcore poor, only 18,000 of them. Only 18,000 of the poor and the hardcore poor gets a blanket subsidy from the government. But today, we get a targeted subsidy, although we are only reaching 50% registration rate at the 120 recipients. We have about 200 over people in the ICASE. But from 18,000, we increase six times to the people who really, really need it. Six times, 18,000 to 100, more than 120,000. And we are not only giving six times more people, we are giving them double of what they get. So this is, again, about sustainability. When you talk about sustainability, it's not only about green, yeah? it's about helping the poor, and the poor needs smart government policy data-driven, that is very targeted to them. So to make sure those who really need help, gets help. So we will continue to increase our uh, registration. Uh, this one, uh, many more, uh, I don't have time to go through. Um, these are for schools. Uh, because we have savings in our uh, uh, open tender uh, through the, uh, the LED lights, initially uh, under our incentive based regulation, we only put LED lights for all the TAB Tiang for first tier uh, cities. Now we are able to save for 200 over 1000 of extra because of open tender. We actually specify 25,000 of them must go to Kampong. Jalan Jalan Kampong, LED light to make sure the Kampong gets more than what KPLB offer. KPLB already offer. That means our development, rural development authority already offer. We give them extra 25,000 of LED light to those who are under TNB Tiang. With TNB Tiang, we can change it. We will change it to uh, extra 25,000. Again, by having an open tender, we get to save a lot more money. And of course, uh, we also pursue a lot of funds from the IPPs. IPPs, uh, independent power producers, in their license, they are supposed to give 1% of their uh, revenue minus uh, uh, cost bahan api to us. Uh, many of them don't uh, pay last time. Now we are trying to pursue more than 250 million from them, like uh, Along. They, they owe us money. For the past 10 years, we get the Tungakan. And we, what we use that for? We use that for uh, tariff cushion. Uh, or some of the policies like we use the money to actually fund Orang Asli Kampung. 13 of our Orang Asli Kampung in, uh, in, uh, in uh, this year, uh, what we approved is this project where 13 Orang Asli Kampung in Pahang will get access to electricity. Uh, three, more than 300 uh, families will benefit from it through the AAIB funds that we get from the IPPs, they are supposed to pay us, but owe us for the last 10 years. So these are some of the things that we do uh, in, the, in, in the ministry. Um, I hope that this gives you a, a, a glimpse of uh, what the government do, and uh, most of all is, uh, is that whenever you talk about sustainability, there is a, uh, there is a lot of needs for uh, uh, thinking in terms of policy, how do we drop policy so that we can actually really benefit not only the environment but people that is at the bottom of the pyramid. How do we make sure that people in the aircon in Putrajaya will actually remember those in the Kampong and Desa to be able to know that they need, they need more brighter Kampong, that some of the orang asli have been deprived of electricity for the past many, many years. 
and how do we make sure that we have a policies that will be able to provide electricity access to them. So with that, I finish uh, 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 my presentation and then we'll open up for dialogue.